The guerrilla soldiers fire their rifles blindly into the jungle. They don't know what exactly they're shooting at, but something is out there among the trees, something they can't see, something that's killing them. One of the young soldiers, barely more than a boy, stops to reload. As he pulls the magazine from his rifle, a blur passes by. The soldier next to him suddenly drops to his knees, clutching his neck, blood pouring out between his fingers. A hand grasps the boy's shoulder, and he spins around, nearly opening fire on his commander. The older man tells him they've got to go, and the boy joins a small group of soldiers who start running through the jungle, trying to get away from whatever this thing is. As they run, there's another flash of movement, and one of the soldiers is pulled into the trees. He can hear his screams mixed with the otherworldly shrieks, but there's nothing they can do. It's already too late for him. Another soldier disappears into the trees with a blur. It's just him and the commander now. They emerge from the jungle into a clearing that contains a small abandoned farm. The commander motions for them to head towards the old farmhouse, and the two take cover around the corner of the home. They crouch with their guns ready, peeking around the corner, looking for any sign of the monster that's killed so many of their comrades. The boy wants to know what they should do. He opens his mouth to ask the commander, but he puts a finger to his lips and motions for the boy to keep watching. The boy peeks around the corner of the house, but he doesn't see anything emerging from the tree line. It's quiet, until the commander begins to scream. The boy turns to see a point forming on his chest. It's a black circle. No, not black, something darker. It's like it is the absence of any and all light. The commander screams louder as the point of darkness grows. The commander's screams fade out, even as it looks like he continues to yell. The boy watches as the commander seems to be collapsing in, sucked into the dark orb in his chest. The commander's body folds in on itself, growing smaller and smaller, until it disappears completely into the black hole, which vanishes along with him. The boy doesn't know what he just saw, but he doesn't have time to think, because emerging from the forest is the creature. The boy has never seen anything like it, and runs into the farmhouse. He locks the door and pushes the old kitchen table in front of it, trying to barricade it as best he can. He looks around and spots a bed against the wall. It's the best hiding spot he can find, so he runs and slides under the bed, pulling himself as close to the wall as he can. The boy watches and waits, unsure of what he should do. It's quiet. There's no more screaming of soldiers being killed or any more of those guttural animal-like squeals. Maybe it decided to go back to wherever it came from. The boy doesn't dare come out from under the bed, though. As he watches the door, waiting for something to burst through, he sees something else. Another of those black points appears in the middle of the room. It looks like it bends the light around it, distorting the room nearby. The boy watches from under the bed as, out of the point, a thin black limb emerges. First one, then another. He can see its strange pointed legs with no feet standing just in front of the bed now. With a high-pitched cry, the creature effortlessly tosses the bed aside. The boy is left exposed, cowering against the wall. The creature screams, opening its wide mouth that seems to split its eyeless face in two, revealing two rows of jagged teeth. The boy screams back, crying in fear, and sees that the creature isn't eyeless after all. Inside its grotesque mouth, a milky blue ball appears. There's no iris, but the boy knows whatever this thing is. It's looking at him. The boy feels his chest grow tight. He looks down to see that one of the black points is forming on his chest. He can feel himself being squeezed and crushed, pulled down into this singular point. All noises, including his screams, disappear as he is pulled into this soundless void. But then he hears something again. He looks up to see that the creature is being riddled with bullets. It turns to escape and bursts through the wall of the farmhouse. The dark orb on the boy vanishes, and he sees, standing in the doorway, his friend and savior. He clutches his bleeding throat with one hand, holding his rifle in the other. The boy rushes to him as he collapses to the floor. Blood is pouring out of his neck, and he can no longer speak. But he dies knowing he saved his young friend. The boy starts to feel very tired, and he sits down next to his dead hero. He's all alone now, his entire group of freedom fighters now wiped out by this demon. The boy feels nauseous and dizzy. He coughs into his hand and looks down to see that it's covered in his own blood. A group of boys run down a jungle path, laughing and playing, when they suddenly stop and grow quiet. There's something up ahead of them. It's a man lying on the side of the road. The boys look scared, unsure if they should check it out. But then the smallest of all of them emerges from the group and bravely marches up to the man. 
Not wanting to let the youngest of their friends make them look like cowards, the rest of the boys soon follow. The man on the side of the road is moaning and looks to be in pain. As they get closer, they can see that he must have been in a terrible accident. His skin is gray, and it looks like his long, thin arms only have three fingers. What should they do? The small boy picks up a stick and reaches out with it to poke the man, not wanting to touch him with his own hands. But before he can, the man rolls over, opening his mouth with a horrible shriek to reveal the glassy blue eye inside as the boys turn and run, hands over their ears. Several weeks later, the small Guatemalan town holds a meeting. A crowd of people in the room are angrily yelling at the mayor who stands at a podium, demanding answers from him about what happened to their dead or missing loved ones. A series of photos are hung on the wall behind the mayor in remembrance of those who have disappeared into the forest or mysteriously died from a rapid illness, including the brave young boy. One man shouts at the mayor, wanting to know where his daughter was. Another asks how her healthy husband could drop dead from an illness after being perfectly healthy only days before. The mayor tries to calm the frustrated townspeople, telling them that he knows there have been rumors of a demon out in the forest, but that's all they are. Rumors. The mayor warns them, though, that something is out there, though he doesn't know what. There is an animal or man that is making people sick. It may also be hunting people. Neither he nor the police know exactly what is going on. But there is good news. A group of men have come to help them. The mayor points towards a stern-looking man in a military uniform who is standing with a small group of other soldiers and a scientist off to the side of the stage. The mayor explains that this man, General Machoy, is from America and that he's going to help them. The crowd doesn't cheer in the way that the mayor seems to have expected, but they at least stop their yelling as the general steps to the podium and thanks the mayor for the introduction. The general looks over the crowd who are waiting and hungry for answers about the monster that's suddenly begun plaguing their town. He tells them that it is true that he's been sent here by the US government in order to investigate what's been happening and stop whatever threat is out there in the jungle by any means necessary. He can't promise that he'll be able to bring back any of their missing loved ones, but he can at least prevent whatever this is from taking any more. He then gestures to the rest of his group and tells the crowd that the men he has brought with him have been specially trained to deal with this exact type of situation, and that they don't need to worry any longer. The only thing everyone needs to do is stay out of their way, and all will be taken care of. With that, he walks off the stage as the crowd erupts into more shouting. General Machoy stops at the scientists waiting next to the stage. Well, Dr. Ketter, what do you think? The scientist adjusts his glasses and answers, This is what we've been preparing for. The overseers kept telling us this day would come. It looks like it finally has. The group of soldiers led by General Machoy make their way through the dense forest. Dr. Ketter is just ahead of them, using a Geiger counter to follow the creature, the audible clicks of the radioactive entity telling him which way it came. They track the source of the radiation to a clearing in the jungle where a small village once stood. Most of the buildings are overgrown with plants and thick vines, but with it growing dark, this seems as safe a place as they will find to make their camp for the night. The soldiers fan out to search what's left of the town, as Dr. Ketter continues looking around for where the radioactive trail might lead them next. As General Machoy is checking out one of the many dark old buildings, one of the older soldiers cries out, Hey General, it looks like this generator still works! With the sound of an old diesel motor coming to life, lights in the village suddenly flicker on. They now have fortifications and light. Though he'd never admit it, General Machoy was feeling nervous about spending the night in the jungle, but now at least some of those nerves were being washed away by the old flickering yellow lights. Later that night, the general is questioning Dr. Ketter on where the creature went. Dr. Ketter is confused, though. His readings showed high traces of radiation leading into this village. The creature came here, he was sure of it, but now he can't figure out where it went. It's as if it came into the village and then simply vanished. Outside, one of the soldiers on watch tells the rest of the group who are sitting around a fire to shut up that he thinks he saw something in the woods. Everyone immediately springs into action, taking defensive positions and aiming their rifles into the dark tree line. There it is again, he says, as a flash of darkness moves just beyond the clearing. No, it's over here, says another soldier on the opposite side. How could the creature be moving so fast around them? Are there multiple of whatever this is out there? The soldiers form a circle to make sure that the thing can't get behind them. What they can't see is the point of darkness forming behind all of their backs, and the thin, pointed legs stepping out of it. The general's radio comes to life. I think we've got something out here, Gen- But his message is cut off by screams and the sound of gunfire. General Machoy tells Dr. Ketter to stay inside and runs out of the building. 
where he finally gets a glimpse of the demon that they've been tracking. The tall, thin creature is massacring his squad. It dashes between them at an inhuman speed, using its three-fingered hands to rip the limbs off of some soldiers and slash at others with its razor-sharp claws, opening up their necks or disemboweling them before moving on to the next. The general fires his rifle at the creature and misses, but it's enough to get it to retreat. General Machoy runs back inside the building where Dr. Ketter is waiting. What was it? What did you see out there? The general doesn't know how to begin describing the monster that just killed all of his men. It's like nothing he's ever seen before, and something that no amount of training could prepare him for. As the two men ponder what to do next, the Geiger counter on the table suddenly starts to click, softly at first, but then more and more, as if a huge amount of radiation has suddenly flooded the room. The general grabs the doctor and drags him out, leaping out of the building just before it collapses in on itself, disappearing into the micro-singularity that formed inside. The two men look up to see it standing right in front of them, its huge mouth open to reveal its glassy blue eye. Look out, Dr. Ketter cries, but he isn't talking about the demon as he and the general roll to the side, just avoiding the power line that has been cut loose by the destroyed building. The power line hits the ground and immediately begins to spark, sending out bright pulses of white electrical light. The creature cries out with a gut-wrenching scream and collapses to the ground, huddling up into a ball as it tries to cover up its mouth with its thin arms. Is it the electricity? The general asks, confused about what suddenly stopped the killer's rampage. But Dr. Ketter realizes it isn't the sparking power line that the creature has been immobilized by, it's the flashing lights. The general doesn't wait for his answer, though, and fires the weighted net from his gun, trapping the howling creature. Dr. Ketter examines the creature at the field research center that has been set up several miles from the village. A strobe light has been affixed to the inside of the creature's cage, but even when the doctor turns the light off, the grayish-brown-skinned entity still remains curled up in a ball on the floor. The doctor wonders if perhaps the creature is hungry, but it shows no interest in any of the various meats, fruits, and vegetables they've presented to it. The doctor stands in the doorway of the tent that has been set up to house the creature's cage and gives an update to General Machoy, who is anxious to get the creature moved to the United States and a more secure containment environment. Dr. Ketter stresses that he fears the journey might kill this creature, though, and put an end to the incredible research and testing they can perform on this amazing living specimen. The general turns to leave but stops to salute the body of one of his soldiers being carried by on a stretcher. Dr. Ketter himself turns to go back to his research when he notices something. The creature's mouth is ever so slightly open. Dr. Ketter has yet another idea. That night, Dr. Ketter enters the temporary morgue and takes a severed arm from one of the dead soldiers. Back in the research tent, he presents the arm to the creature, sliding it through the cage bars. The creature doesn't react, but Dr. Ketter continues to watch and wait. After a time, the creature finally stirs. It's the first time he has seen it move since it was captured. The creature reaches out with its long, three-fingered hand and grabs the arm before starting to feed on it. You like that, don't you? Dr. Ketter asks, and bizarrely, the creature seems to respond, giving an almost baby-like coo. There's lots more of that if you behave. All I want is to study you, learn how you work. The creature continues to feed, starting to crunch on the bones now that all the meat is gone. Yes, I believe you'll be good, the doctor says as he approaches the cage. You're going to make me world famous. Soon, everyone will know the name Herman Ket- The creature's hand shoots out from between the bars so quickly he never even saw it. Dr. Ketter starts to scream as it grasps and claws at him. A soldier standing guard outside runs in but a black point of light immediately appears on his torso, causing him to fold in on himself into the singularity. The creature drops the bloody Dr. Ketter to the floor, who reaches for the emergency strobe light activation button as another singularity opens up inside of the cage. The creature appears to willfully step into it before emerging out of another just outside of the bars. More soldiers rush into the tent in time to see the creature feeding on the still-living Dr. Ketter. One presses the button to activate the high-powered strobe lights, which cause the creature to start screaming and thrashing about, trying to escape the flashing lights. Multiple nets are fired onto the creature, pinning it to the ground as its screams slowly fade back to whimpers. On overseer orders, the creature is moved to ADRX-19, a secure base located somewhere in North America. The site's director gives a presentation to a group and explains that thanks to the work of the late Dr. Ketter, they now know that the creature exhibits signs of fear and sickness when in the presence of strobing lights, and that it is unable to produce the micro-singularities that it uses for defense and teleportation when it is in this sickened state. When healthy, though, the creature is extremely dangerous thanks to its superhuman speed, strength, and cunning. 
it was also discovered that it is unable to teleport through lead, which its new containment cell has been lined with, and extreme security procedures have been implemented, including the installation of a reinforced steel blast door, and constant patrols of the outside of the cell by armed guards who are equipped with high-powered strobe lights. The site director leaves the room and the overseers discuss the fate of the creature which has been given the designation number 86243AR-001, though most have taken to calling it simply 001. One of the overseers argues that the creature must be secured and contained in order to protect humanity. Who knows how many more of these might be out there? They now know that the rumors of these types of entities aren't merely isolated events, and that there could be countless more of these anomalies. Hundreds, maybe even thousands. The rest of the overseers unanimously agree. One of them picks up the report that was left behind by the site director. Redact this report immediately and start a new document archive. This is only the prototype. I have the feeling there will be many more of these. I hope you enjoyed this special exploration of an SCP-001 proposal. Let me know in the comments if you'd like to see more like this, and make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.